welcome back. So today what we're going to be doing is applying these ideas of probability, this terminology, these definitions, and maybe just kind of finding some real basic probabilities. Okay, so oftentimes, especially when I'm using my classical approach and I'm trying to find some probabilities, the first thing I need to do is define my sample space. All right, so some simple, easy examples of sample spaces that we often see that you should probably be familiar with because when you're solving probability problems, I'm sure you'll deal with these types of sample spaces. All right, number one, a coin toss. Okay, so that's pretty simple. For anybody who's not familiar with that, already knows coins, heads or tails. Okay, easy enough. But the point here is, here's how we list a sample space. Usually use some sort of set notation, brackets or something like that. And our two distinct outcomes are heads and tails. Okay, extending that to a dice roll. All of our possible outcomes, one through six there. Okay, another sample space that most people are probably familiar with, but not everybody, so we need to just make sure we're all on the same page there, is a deck of cards. Right? So the idea of how a deck of cards is laid out, there's, there's four suits, two of them black, two of them red, 13 cards in each suit, right? and those cards consist of the number cards, 2 through 10, Jack, Queen, King, Ace, for a total of 52 cards. Right? So that's what our, our sample space would look like there. Right? What about when I've got multiple things going on, tossing two coins? That's where our sample spaces get more interesting. Okay, so tossing two coins... So duh, there's the obvious ones, heads, heads, tails, tails. All right, but where it gets interesting is, well, what about if I get heads on one, tails on the other? Does it matter which coin is which? Are those two distinct outcomes? Well, yes, All right, because I could get heads on the first, tails on the second, tails on the first, heads on the second. These are two distinct outcomes. Okay, so there's actually four ways that tossing two coins could turn out. Okay, with that in mind, what about two dice? Well, kind of the logic I applied here was that, okay, I've got two outcomes and I'm tossing two dice. Two squared is four. That's pretty easy. All right, what about tossing two dice, though? Okay, so maybe we could apply that same logic. Well, one through six, there's six options, throwing two dice. 36 total outcomes. Can you visualize that in your head? Well, let's actually look at a picture of that next and find some basic probabilities here. All right, so again, try to visualize that sample space in your head if you can. There are actually 36 total possibilities, right? and it looks like this. So should each of those outcomes be equally likely? Yes. All right, so this outcome a 1 and a 1 should have the same probability as, say, uh, a 3 and a 5. So is a 3 and a 5 different from, say, a 5 and a 3? Yes, those are distinct outcomes. All right, so let's use this sample space and the fact that we have 36 equally likely outcomes to find some probabilities of events. All right, say our first event is rolling a 2. So my event is rolling a 2. I've got 36 total outcomes. How many outcomes are included in that event? Well, I've actually already circled it here. There's only one outcome right, where it's rolling a sum of two. right? And, and sums are, in most games, typically what, what we're interested in there. Okay, so that's a 1 in 36 probability. What about rolling a 7? Okay, so if you want to take a minute to see well, which outcomes would mean a sum of 7, right, maybe you'll notice that it's actually goes up this diagonal here. All right, so there is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 outcomes where we would, which would result in a sum of 7. So 6 out of the 36 are a 1 in 6 chance of rolling a 7. All right. 
actually if you're recognizing this kind of diagonal pattern maybe you're thinking here a seven is your most common roll and yes that's true All right. what about in some games you get to go again if you if you roll doubles right two of the same number well can you recognize a pattern there so this sum of two is actually doubles that we talked about sum of four and so forth there's another kind of diagonal pattern there's six possibilities there so a seven is our most likely sum doubles is just as likely as a seven All right, so maybe you can kinda of apply those ideas to some some games you may play in the future alright next let's look at an example to kinda of pull together some of this terminology we're not necessarily gonna solve for all these probabilities but we're gonna to pull together a terminology okay so say we surveyed all the students in our class and we're gonna ask them a list of questions and then we're gonna to try to write them in probability notation what do these questions what what prob probabilities do they represent okay so the question maybe we ask we record the results of do you have change in your pocket all right this would be the probability of having change or call it event C what about do you not have change in your pocket? Right. This would be the complement of having change. Okay, what about did you ride the bus today? Probability of riding the bus, let's call that event B. Okay, then maybe we record the number that answered yes to either the first or the second questions. So people that have change or rode the bus that is what we would call a union the probability of change or bus or we could write it like this with our our symbol u right, what about the if we recorded the number of people that said yes to the first question and the second question well, these are people that had change and rode the bus right, that's the intersection of c and b finally what if we said out of everybody, if we gathered everybody who said yes to question two, yes, they did ride the bus, and then we saw how many had change. That is what we call a conditional probability, right? We're, we're thinning our field down to only people who said yes or only people who rode the bus, and then we're seeing if we have change. Maybe we think that riding the bus or given you rode the bus, does that make you more likely to have change in your pocket? Maybe. All right, so hopefully this helps you sort out kind of all the terminology. All right, we've got complements, units, intersections, conditional probability. And we're not necessarily going to find many of these probabilities right now. We'll see how to apply a bunch of these rules in the future, but let's try to apply our simplest probability rule here, right, our complement rule. All right, so the probability that somebody lives in an industrialized country is one-fifth, find the probability they do not live, simply apply the complement rule. And we can say, just randomly choosing a person in the world, there's a four and five chance they're not in an industrialized country. So that probably seems super simple. Applying the complement rule by itself is extremely simple. Right? But usually, what we're going to be doing with the complement rule is applying it with alongside other rules and one situation where it's very very useful is in a situation where I'm asked something like this what's the probability of at least one thing happen okay for example the probability of if I'm producing a product of having no defects is 86 percent what's the probability it has at least one defect okay so the reason this helps us is at least one defect in a manufacturing process, that means one defect, two defects, three defects, four defects, up to infinity defects. All right? There would be an infinite amount of terms to calculate to find this probability, at least one defect. It would be impossible to do. But with the complement rule, if I know the probability of no defects, the probability of at least one defect is one minus that. 
So the complement rule made our life really easy, super easy to apply this idea to make an impossible problem to solve easy. All right. So those are just kind of applying the ideas from this section. Hope that kind of brings together all of this terminology and notation and those kind of things for you. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.